All right, good afternoon. Welcome to the IATA Digital Cargo Webinars for 2021. We will start the session shortly. Good afternoon, uh, good morning uh, to everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, IATA uh, Digital Cargo Webinars for 2021. Uh, as most of you know, this is normally a face-to-face -face conference and this is the second time we've done it in COVID mode uh, via webinar. So uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, we've got a really interesting program lined up for you and I'm actually trying to get my presentation up because I can't see anything here. But um, maybe just... Uh, Let me just fix that, okay? Apologies. Okay. Okay, perhaps uh, Claire, can you confirm that you see my um, presentation? Yes, we can see it. Can you see me as well? We can see you. Oh, perfect! Thank you very much. So, welcome everybody. Um, it's always it's always a new experience to kick off a webinar. Certainly, the first one of a long series. Uh, but I um, I'm pleased to confirm that all the speakers are online, so they're waiting uh, they're waiting. Uh, uh, behind the uh, the screen uh, to, to, to come in. Uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, we are actually recording this uh, this webinar, so so hopefully you're okay with that. If not, then probably um, it's a good time to to leave. But I'm sure that you you appreciate the fact that uh, we want to share this afterwards. We'll put it on our website, and what we've seen from last year is that there's really a lot of people that actually watch these things at the time that suits them. So it's a really uh, it's a good way to do it. Um, secondly, um, uh, we have some great speakers, we really do, I'll introduce them in a second. And so if you have any questions, please ask them through the Q&A, throughout the presentations, throughout the discussions, and then uh, after the presentations, after the panel has, has introduced themselves and, and their topics, we will then pick up some of these questions and address them uh, together. Um, with that, just a, a quick reminder, this is a series of seven webinars, in fact. Uh, today's the executive session and then later this week on thursday we'll have the digital cargo session with david uh, david so then we'll have the interactive cargo session with sonia uh, then we get the pilot and hackathon session uh, with uh, arno then we'll have a one record session a week after again uh, with uh, christophe lambert then we have a special session with the eu federated project where we have some external speakers uh, from that project of which IATA is part so i think that's going to be an interesting one because it's a bit different topic than you may be used to at our conference and then we have a seventh session with the products team who is going to be uh, demonstrating and, and talking about the products that we currently have and some new things that uh, uh, that we have actually put out in the last year um, and a very interesting year it was indeed um, let's let's maybe, maybe introduce the uh, webinar today the executive session 
I think we will all agree that an awful lot has changed in the last year. Uh, since March 2020, uh, when, when most of us were sent home from one day to the next. And then we've been through this whole pandemic, which is not quite over yet. And in that year, um, the agenda has really changed. Uh, if I were to look at the agenda that we would have had at that time for a conference like this, it would have looked very, very different. And some of the things that have happened since then, and I put some, some um, just some phrases out there that I've heard in, in, in the last year, things like the acceleration of digitalization. I hear that a lot. Uh, the fact that air cargo is a critical resource, you know, it, it's, in fact, we probably wouldn't be where we are with the vaccination programs if it hadn't been for air cargo, but not just that. As you see a bit lower, the e-commerce has been a very important element as well. In fact, um, in one year of e-commerce, the, the progress in terms of growth of e-commerce is the equivalent of three years that we had forecasted. So we're actually in 2021, almost in the year 2025, if the growth had been uh, continuous and uh, as forecasted, which was still exponential for that matter. Um, we had words like furlough that before the pandemic, I hadn't really heard it much. Uh, in fact, I even discovered that it's a Dutch word. I'm Dutch, so I was a bit surprised I didn't know that. Um, and uh, then we had this, what I think is a terrible word, freighters, uh, passenger freighters. Um, you've all seen those. Um, teleworking, of course, was 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 the one of the things that have happened. And, and of course, all of this has an impact on digitalization. I mean, teleworking and digitalization are almost one and the same. Uh, another topic that has come up is sustainability of air cargo, of course, that existed before, and we'll discuss a bit later if anything has changed there. And then, you know, one big question mark that I, I have myself, you know, I, and I should know the answer to this, but what's business travel going to look like going forward? You know, will we be doing these webinars forever? Um, will we be doing hybrid meetings or in a year from now, maybe we figure out all of this is a bad dream and I'll go back to business as usual. I think that um, in this webinar today, you'll be hearing from, from three executives on their views on some of these questions related to their business. And in particular, I think we'll be hearing uh, the impact of pandemic digitalization. We'll talk about uh, sustainability. And in fact, most of the other topics that you may see there will come up one way or the other. So without further ado, let me introduce you uh, the panel that we have. Um, our first speaker is going to be Dorothy von Boxberg. Um, she is the uh, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Lufthansa Cargo. And so we're absolutely delighted to, to have uh, Dorothy with us today and hear about what's happening at, at Lufthansa at, at this time and, and how some of these topics uh, are relevant to Lufthansa and to the rest of the world. Um, we'll then have Lionel van der Walt, who's the Chief Commercial Officer at Pay Cargo. So he's going to give us uh, a perspective on our cargo in general, but in particular on the payment side of things, where, where things are changing as well. So change all over the place. And then we'll have Christian Riege, who is many things. Uh, he's co-owner of Riege, so he's, he's not just VP, he's managing director, he's everything uh, with his colleagues and his family. Um, he's in charge of software development and, and we're going to hear his perspective on the digitalization uh, with respect to air cargo. What are some of the challenges that, that they see at Riga and also what are some of the solutions? So uh, with that, I would like to invite Dorothea to, um, to, to, to join and I'm going to um, just give her the... Uh, thank you. Hi, Dorothea. <laughs> Um, thank you for joining us. I'm just going to give the, uh, um, the what you might call it, the, uh, the screen to you. Okay, make presenter, there you go. So you're receiving, you should be seeing that soon. Thank you. So Hank, uh, could you also please confirm that you can see my um, screen now? I can see your screen, I can see you and I can hear you. So we're all, everything is set. Super. So I'm going to um, step away myself and I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you. So good day from Frankfurt, uh, from my side, and thanks, uh, Hank, for introducing me. So now my screen has changed, I guess. Oops, that's not how it should be. Why is it? Yeah, okay. And um, well, you just said uh, that uh, this session is the executive session and the next one will be the one on digital cargo. I'm afraid that also today this one might be on digital cargo because uh, this is such an important uh, topic in our industry. And I think it's, um, well, also uh, taking a lot of my time and my thoughts uh, on how, what we can do. 
Thank you also asked me to introduce Lufthansa Cargo a bit, and that's what I'll do on the next page. I guess most of you will know us, uh, but maybe a few things uh, that might be interesting. So um, we don't only sell Lufthansa Cargo's freighter and Lufthansa Passage's bellies, but also the bellies of uh, Brussels, of Austrian, of Eurowings. Um, so that's definitely uh, a broader range that we have. And uh, of course, you know that the long haul aircraft not only in Lufthansa Group, but in many other airlines have been on ground uh, for for most of the last year and uh, most of the capacity. And so really having this ramp up now coming back and uh, this extra capacity coming back is of course something we're looking forward to a lot, uh, but that might also be a challenge when there's a lot of capacity coming in at the same time from the carrier's perspective. Then uh, you, Henk, mentioned already the freighter options. Uh, we still have some freighters up and running. I think we did it less than some of the other carriers, uh, but it's always been a means to, to add flexible capacity in the market at fairly high prices because, I mean, the bellies are not made uh, for, for freight and uh, they carry a lot less uh, than, than a usual freighter at somewhat similar trip costs. We're in the lucky situation that we are about to finish our 777 rollover. So um, uh, by September, I guess, we'll have a pure 777 fleet. Uh, and that's, uh, of course, making our lives easier than having two rather small fleets at the same time. So we're getting in this then nice uh, 14 aircraft, uh, 15 aircraft, actually, 777 uh, freighter fleet. We've also been lucky to get a big commitment from the Lufthansa Group uh, by end of last year, which is uh, that, that we completely rebuilt our Lufthansa Cargo Center in Frankfurt, our big hub. Um, and that's something that's, I think, really necessary because um, some of the infrastructure has come to age and we are very much looking forward to investing into the future here in our hub. The COVID vaccination, I think, is one of the topics that has been in the press a lot. Uh, so um, there's a, yeah. And we, like many other carriers, have, of course, uh, looked into what can we offer, what are the products that we can offer. We see that it's now uh, taken up in the market after initially uh, most of the vaccines were kept in the region where they were produced. So in the US, for the US, in India, for India, in Europe, for Europe, and so on. But now we see more also of the COVID vaccines flying. And um, if you look at the, uh, the CIV Pharma, certificate we've got now 32 stations certified that means uh, we really have a long-standing commitment for sharp pharma shipments we've doing it for years it's really a long process to get um, not only the facility uh, certified but also the processes and the staff to make sure that it's really working really smoothly for these kinds of shipments so that's kind of the fast introduction um, on Lufthansa cargo but now going more into the digital space so our aim is to make our air cargo more convenient for our customers and also faster for our customers. And maybe reliable would another, be another good word uh, to say, how do we think uh, could be the future of air cargo? And um, I think it's around uh, three themes um, that we see most of the innovation. So on the booking side, I guess many customers are used to the e-commerce world so uh, you sit on your sofa in the evening you browse a little bit you select what you would like and then one two three more clicks and you should definitely be done and that's not been true for air cargo for most of the past and um, i think uh, covid 19 has now also been a huge accelerator for that uh, and i'll be talking to that a bit more in a minute e-freight of course is this whole discussion of can I make the information flow separate of the physical goods flow? You all know that uh, for most of the past, uh, information and goods have been flying together. That's not a very efficient process. Uh, the information can get lost. Uh, the next, uh, uh, the next uh, person in the value chain may not have the information that would already be valuable. So think about customs. You don't want uh, a good to arrive at the airport and then uh, discuss customs clearance, but you really would like to have that information earlier and already know which pieces need to be shown uh, to, uh, to customs. And pre-check is also going into a similar direction. So when shipper and forwarder already know what the exact uh, sizes and uh, commodity and uh, weight of a shipment is, why should we as an airline not 
know it and use that FWB message information to also do the um, document um, acceptance already. And that means that we don't have uh, the kind of peak work on the classical Thursday evening or afternoon when suddenly many shipments come at the same time and sometimes you need to uh, ask a question back to your customer but then uh, the agent may not be in the office anymore and in the worst case uh, the shipment uh, gets offloaded. Um, so I think we can become better, faster and more reliable by using uh, digital data exchange. Cargo One and Web Cargo Net, I think, are two very good examples of um, what customers like to see. That is good user interfaces, uh, where it's kind of fun to work with rather than uh, like a hideous process that I need to go through. And uh, I think it's also this transparency among several carriers that is attractive uh, for our customers, why they're both um, taking up uh, a lot of attention, but also real bookings uh, in the marketplace. And uh, yet, I mean, looking at it from the Lufthansa Cargo's perspective, of course, let me just change this a little bit. From a Lufthansa Cargo perspective, we of course also have our own sales channel, our own e-booking. Um, why do we have that? Because we think we can still serve our customers even better with our dedicated customer interface. So for example, uh, we think air freight in terms of commodity together with a certain speed, and then together with some add-on services. And I'm not so sure how fast um, platforms that work for the whole market will be able to offer specific add-on services that we would like to offer our customers. And, and so I think we our own channel is just more flexible and uh, hopefully an even better service solution uh, for our customers and their specific needs. So that's something we've been working on uh, throughout the last year. And it's really a question of, um, user interface, uh, so usability a lot, but it's also about offering new services. And, and we've got our digital sales team up and running that is now uh, doing this very incremental approach, new things very often rather than a long project and then a big bang uh, after a while. So um, yeah, I think uh, our customers can really look forward to the progress we're now making on the digital sales side. And the APIs is kind of uh, the additional um, offering that we have. APIs can offer all kinds of information. You see that here on the screen. Um, and that information can be offered either to the platforms like Cargo One, but it's also something that we offer directly to our customers. So uh, some of our large customers don't want to go via an intermediary, uh, via a platform, but directly linked to us. And of course, that's very welcome for us because again, then we can go into this discussion um, uh, how can we best display our offer uh, towards our customers? And um, that's also already happening. And I think a good way going forward. Uh, my my idea is always let the customer go where it's most convenient for the customer. And it, it's really their choice uh, where they would like to see us. And that's why we're also very open for other platforms. Uh, so if there are customers in specific regions or with specific requirements that ask us to go on to another place, I think we'll be there. Uh, and the same is also true, of course, for direct connections. E-Freight is, of course, another big focus. Um, you all know for how long we as an industry have been working on uh, getting towards e-airway bill. And I think we've achieved decent levels, but it, it's really all about now getting to the 100%. And we've got a big 100% E-Freight campaign right now, where we really work very much in detail with particular stations, particular cu customers, um, where we really look into why is it not working? Why are some customers having it good in some regions and not in others? Um, of course, uh, we rely a lot on YATA to also help us getting some of the countries still agree to the standard uh, uh, that, that haven't done so yet. And, um, and it's not only about the ER label, of course, but it's also about all the other documents that we would like to get into a digital format. And this next one here is just a, an example for EDGD because uh, dangerous goods declarations are really something that several players need to work with, the shipper, the forwarder, but also we as a carrier. 
and um, having that information ready and uh, kind of downloadable or uh, available to look at at all times is of course uh, very helpful. And Infrate is right now our provider here in Frankfurt, uh, but we're also available uh, on other platforms like, for example, DG Office Net. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a great process that really helps to reduce the number of offloads, uh, the number of uh, questions back to the uh, previous people in the value chain. Uh, it's a process uh, that really makes our industry easier and better. And, uh, and I would really see that be adopted much more. That would be really a hope. Pre-check um, goes in the same direction. I mentioned it already. It's really um, whenever somebody is handing in our, his, his or her FWB data to us, it will be checked. And we have an automatic check part of it. But when that doesn't run through smoothly, then of course people will look at it and, and have a check uh, on, on what's missing and get back, back to our customers. And uh, depending on the degree of interlinkage we've got with our customers, it's more or less automated, but it can get to a very high degree of automation where the error messages are very clearly understood by the customers. They know what to do as well. And then their system can even answer our requests. So I think over time, uh, that, that's also a great source for efficiency. And then at the airport, it can also mean that truck drivers just don't spend so much time waiting uh, at uh, documentation, but can go right, right to the ramp. I think that's also another benefit uh, that should also bring productivity and, and therefore uh, really move our industry forward. One record, of course, at a Yata meeting, you would mention that, but we are definitely very convinced that this is a very good way going forward. So one single shipment record rather than people having different parts of information all over the place a clear place where the data is and uh, rules for data ownership and then an easy way to share that information uh, through very well defined apis i think that's very much what we support what we would like to see more in the industry and where i'm also looking forward uh, to the distribution side uh, of, of one record uh, to make the whole API business in the booking arena easier. So putting it all together, I think a lot of value is in the data. So having data, using data, and then doing, for example, uh, predictions, doing forecasts, uh, but also just making sure that data is available in different places on earth, uh, while the shipment may still be in the former place, I think that's very helpful. Leverage services probably more means bring in new services, find new services that are just possible because data can be in several places. Uh, and that requires us to rethink the way we look at IT. It also requires some invest in IT and um, also in, in making our processes better. I think often we have some parts of the process chain digitized. But then there's this break again, and people have kind of to manually re-entry data and so on. These are kinds of the things uh, where everybody hates the process and then rather goes back to the old manual world altogether. And I think we can change it by just offering much better processes. And get connected, I mean, that's of course very interesting. Uh, it's this question of it's not enough to have me, myself, and Lufthansa Cargo uh, digitized, but it's an industry where you've got so many partners, uh, partners in crime, getting things done together, and it only works when you're really connected. Otherwise, again, uh, there's such a source of mistakes uh, going from one party to the next one when you re-enter data, uh, when things go lo get lost, and so on. Yeah, I've got another topic that is a little less digital. That's uh, the question of sustainability. I think it was also on your list of important topics. Um, you may know that um, last year we had the first uh, freighter flight, long haul freighter flight that was uh, CO2 neutral. And uh, that is possible if you uh, fly with SAF, sustainable aviation fuel, and then sustainable aviation fuel is still creating a certain CO2 fit footprint, which in that case uh, we offset uh, with the reforesting program. So really doing these things together, it is possible already today uh, to fly CO2 neutrally, um, but it's still a very small percentage of sustainable aviation fuels that is 
even available. And it's also a question of um, price, of course, because it's, it's fairly expensive to use it. Um, but more than that, it's still a discussion of uh, awareness. And uh, I'm very happy to see that it's kind of the most discussed topic uh, in all the customer meetings I'm having uh, over the last half year. So it's really a topic that has taken up considerably compared to, to like a year ago or something where it was kind of a non-topic. Uh, but there's also still a large way we all need to go uh, if we want to, to make flying a lot more socially acceptable and a lot more climate friendly. And uh, just telling you a little bit how we do it. Fleet, I think, is from an airline's perspective always the biggest factor. So if you fly with modern aircraft, you have a completely different uh, CO2 footprint than with old aircraft. So if we look back uh, in our history, uh, 25 years ago, we were still flying DC-8s and they were um, having the double the footprint, uh, the carbon footprint uh, per kilo uh, than the 777s uh, today have. But then, uh, I mean, I said we are getting to this full 777 fleet, which is great. But then we are at the end of uh, what technology can do for us right now. So there is no more modern aircraft and we cannot um, yeah, go the next step there. We still hope for the um, aircraft manufacturers, of course, but that will take some time. And so the next step has to do with reducing fuel further. That's a lot of small steps you need to take and you need to work on it's uh, things like uh, the approach uh, or the flight routes that the pilots take it's about uh, reducing weight in the aircraft so for example we've got lightweight containers um, it's about um, can you make your aircraft more dynamic that's something that we now start with a new shark skin technology um, that Lufthansa Technik has invented together with BASF um, but and it's helpful, we should do it and we can do it and it's actually economical because uh, fuel is so expensive, uh, but then you still get to a limit and then to close that gap, there are two ways to do it. Either you buy sustainable aviation fuels or you go into offsetting. Offsetting means that um, at the point of flight, the CO2 is emitted and then only over a long time frame, say 10 years, 20 years, it's taken back from the atmosphere into, for example, a tree. Uh, sustainable aviation fuel works the other way around. Before you fly, you take the CO2 out of the atmosphere and then put it back in uh, during the flight. So SAF is, of course, a lot more immediate in its effect. It's, it's also a lot more expensive. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's an interesting question on how can we exactly go? What are the steps we can take as an industry together uh, to make sure that uh, flying goods is a good way also to do for the climate. And uh, last but not least here is what we have now as an offer for all of our customers. Uh, that's a CO2 calculator. Whenever you fly, you can see exactly what the CO2 emissions of that uh, shipment are. I think that's important uh, because it's um, showing you options. I mean, you always have options with direct flights, uh, where do you connect? What type of aircraft do you take? And that makes a lot of difference on how much um, of CO2 do you emit. And um, I think making that tra information transparent is the first step. But from then on, of course, uh, the next steps are to offsetting that uh, CO2. Well, that's my part uh, for the introduction. Um, and uh, very much looking forward to your questions and the discussion. But of course, first handing over to the other speakers. Thank you very much, Dorothea. Uh, and thank you also for putting the um, uh, sustainability uh, topic on the table. We'll come back to that during the Q&A, uh, but it's definitely something that I think is, is a lot more relevant now. And I actually believe that digitalization, digitalization can help with that. And in fact, has an important mm -hmm. role to play as well. And so um, we'll come back to that during the Q&A, um, the panel discussion, of course, and uh, we'll see what comes out of that. So thank you very much for your presentation and we'll speak to you later. Thank you. So the, um, the, next, uh, the next speaker is uh, Lionel van der Velt, uh, who is the CCO of PayCargo. So Lionel, there you are. Uh, welcome to the, uh, the Digital Cargo webinar, the executive session. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking to you now. I'll talk to you later. So I'm going to uh, give you the um, uh, I'm going to give you the the screen. Let me see. Um, let me 
go to find you. Yep, there you are. And you should be receiving it now. Okay, so, okay, very good. Uh, we can see our, your screen, including the um, speaker notes. Okay, so we've got the wrong screen that it's showing. Just give me a second. Yeah, no problem. I, I see in the speaker notes, you have to pay your compliments to the host. It's okay. Can you see my screen now, the presentation, Hank? No, we can still see the uh, the, the PDF okay. uh, with the yeah, notes. Yeah. But um, would you like me to, okay. Would you like me to reset and start again? Yes, if you can just do that, let's just try that. You may, be, you may be fixed on that window now. Um, so I'm just gonna take it away from you for now. And I'll give it back. You, you may want to select the option of share my screen because then you can just, whatever you put on your screen is going to be shared rather than a specific window. That's it. You, you see the presentation now? I do, but I see the main slide and the next slide so okay so we're having a bit of a technical <laughs> issue i'm not um, sure it's a problem um it's up to you if you want to uh yeah i'm just trying to see if i can quickly change this to uh to the right format here on my side just give me a second sorry about that yeah no problem yeah So while you're doing that, um, maybe to pick up a couple of points that uh, Dorothea made, one interesting anecdote I'd like to share with you. Uh, Dorothea mentioned that, uh, of course, you know, uh, paper for, for documentation for freight is not the most optimal uh, way of doing it, uh, that you really want to have your information arrive before the freight arrives, and so paper doesn't do it. Interestingly enough, on the maritime mode, they don't have this problem, because they all ship their paper with air freight. And so uh, when their ships arrive, the paper has arrived long before them. You got it here, um, Lionel. So I will, uh, I will step back and I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hank. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to join you here today. So what I wanted to start off with is just to highlight one of the aspects that we think is really key for the industry today. So the freight industry is at a pivotal crossroad. Um, you know, COVID-19 not only forced businesses to adapt, but radically changed the way that they operate. And as demand and clients' expectations for speed and transparency grow exponentially, the freight industry needs to rely on advanced technologies to keep pace. Failure to adapt to such solutions will be costly and lead to significant disruptions, and the payment side of the business is obviously no exception. And this is where we believe PayCargo comes in as the industry's uh, most trusted online freight payment platform. What I wanted to do today is really just provide a brief introduction as to who PayCargo is, draw back that veil as to how we approach the industry and how we've been so successful as a financial tech company driving digitalization across the industry. One of the things I find a lot of the time is that when people speak to me, they really just look at PayCargo as a payment service provider. And that is true, but it's not really how we view ourselves. We view ourselves as a company that's facilitating regional, national, and global economic growth and industry, industry sustainability. And the way that we're doing that, obviously, is by using new technologies to drive efficiency and take out a lot of, for example, paper processes that, that's really not sustainable, but also speeding up trade by using these technologies, which then down the line 
has values and adds values such as you know uh, removing an amount of truck movements or improving the truck movements at airports and therefore reducing fuel spend. One thing that's interesting I thought that I'd share with you is what our company's business philosophy is that's really been a key to our success. You know, it's, it's, it's really important for us to know what our strategy is uh, and to really remain focused on that strategy. There are so many shiny balls out there within the industry and opportunities. And if we are chasing and constantly changing swim lanes, it really does not help us to be successful. So part of Pay Progress success has really been this laser focus on you know, just sticking to the payment swim lane and helping to transform that within the industry. One of the keys to our success also is by doing that, we also have a very open collaborative approach. So as a company, we understand that we are just one stakeholder within the value chain. And if we are truly to digitize and transform the industry, we need to be working with all the other service providers out there, collaborating with them to facilitate API integrations that really add value across the, the, the industry to all our partners. And as part of that philosophy, we also consider ourselves to be a problem solver. So we are constantly working to innovate and listening to our clients and our partners to see what are the pain points within the industry and how do we all work together to overcome those. And not just how do we overcome those, but how do we overcome them using these latest technologies that will add value to everybody across the, the supply chain, but also doing that in an extremely agile and flexible way, meaning that if we want to be successful, we need to be ahead of the game and we need to be thinking proactively about what's going to happen within the industry in terms of all these new technologies, threats, opportunities, and then making changes very quickly if needed in order to uh, add the value that our clients demand of us. And then obviously, like with many other companies, you know, one of the things that we're very focused on is having this best in class mentality meaning that when we are hiring people, we're making sure we're getting the best people into the company. And at the core, we are people from within the industry um, building and running this company. So it's not just another payment service provider that's across uh, many different industries. This is really a solution that has specifically been designed for our partners within the industry. From a business model perspective, what's interesting and a lot of people are surprised by is that we tend to do as much as possible as a free service for our clients. And that includes both payers and vendors. And even when it gets to the, the payer side where we our business model is to charge a fee per transaction, we have steep discounts that we provide to partners based on the amount of volumes that they process and, and uh, partner with us. So it's, it's really, really important for us to make sure that we grain this for all the stakeholders and that it's not only focused on one channel. One of the biggest value adds we have is the economy of scales that we bring to our clients uh, as a multimodal payment service provider. And then obviously what we're also doing is that we are focused on facilitating all payments, irrespective of the geography and the mode. So really looking across the globe at what are the opportunities, what are the pay points, and how do we address those in an efficient way using all the latest digital technologies and driving that transformation, which is it's not always easy. But what we are finding is that uh, there are many companies out there, like we've just heard from Dorothea, that have got a, you know, projects in place to drive transformation, looking at platforms like One Cargo, Web Cargo, et cetera. And then we obviously looking from our side as to how do we work with those to ensure that we have this value add across the whole value chain. Pay Cargo, Considers ourselves, we consider ourselves as a neutral online payment platform. 
And that is one of the strong pulls on our side and also the fact that we are multimodal. Now the company started on the maritime side with a couple of executives from that industry who were getting pretty frustrated with the fact that they could not get import related um, products, et cetera, being released on time because of payments and the inefficiencies on the payment side. So they really started looking at how do we use technology to disrupt this and bring a solution that will expedite trade. And that's when this ecosystem started building. And it was a very traditional view of who vendors and payers are within the industry. So the vendors were basically the ocean carriers and ports, and the payers were the shippers, freight forwarders, custom brokers, beneficial cargo owners, etc. Very quickly, as this ecosystem on the maritime side started scaling and growing, there was a strong pull from the payers, the shippers, the forwarders, the custom brokers, et cetera, with pay cargo to say, listen, you're doing a great job on the maritime side, but we are transacting across all these other, other modes. We would like to gain the same benefits there. And that's when pay cargo rolled out to the aviation side, the rail and the road. Now, once again, if you look at the traditional model and term that we used as a vendor within our system, on the aviation side, it was the airlines and ground handlers. But with COVID and in the last year, 18 months to a year, we've seen quite a change taking place. And, and that change has really blurred the lines and definitions as to what you would consider a payer versus a vendor within our ecosystem. And the reason for that is that we've seen a lot of payers now starting to realize that they can pay other payers, so forwarders paying forwarders within our ecosystem. And at the same time, we've also seen what we consider as traditional vendors, being airlines, ground handlers, ports, ocean carriers, et cetera, also realizing that there's a lot of value in using pay cargo to pay others. So basically what we've ended up with is an ecosystem where all the users can be considered both as payers and vendors. I'm not going to bore you with all the details on this very busy slide, but one thing that I want to highlight here is that a big part of our business, and Dorothea also uh, touched on this, is data. So yes, pay goes at the core, we are facilitating payments, but the way that we do this is really to focus on ensuring that there's a seamless flow of data across systems and then providing instant access to data so that people can have visibility on what is transpiring in the business as it is taking place. Part of our biggest value add over and, over and above facilitating the payments is building in customized workflows for our partners. And what this really does is it really enables head offices and regional offices to gain visibility of their operations at local level, and even gives them the ability to gain control over those operations. For example, being able to, uh, through our system, to facilitate who can make payments, who can only um, submit a payment versus authorizing it, what amounts can be paid, what amounts can be paid over a weekend versus a week to various vendors. So really providing them a lot of control over payments over and above the visibility and access to data, et cetera. The other aspect that I think is critical here is once again, that open collaborative role that we play and the positive impact that has by creating the seamless flow of data. The, the integrations that we do both with payers and vendors are critical to the value that it adds to both sides of the equation. So for example, what we do with the vendors is we integrate both on all the, I'm sorry, on all the modes um, with the operational systems. And what this does is it really helps to uh, eliminate a lot of manual processes there, side having to access multiple systems, et cetera. But it also adds value to the payers because what we then do is when a payer wants to do a transaction, all they have to do is enter an airway bill, 
into the system and we immediately pull the amounts that needed to pay and all the rest of the details of the transaction from the vendor's system, thereby eliminating a lot of post-transaction disputes and the typical sort of issues that you see with human area that creeps in when people are manually processing transactions. The other side of the equation also is that we're always looking to see how can we eliminate cost and lower the cost of the platform for our members. So by eliminating credit card merchant fees for vendors, and when I say vendors, once again, I want to be very clear, as I mentioned previously, vendors could be airlines, it could be your ocean carriers, ground handlers, but it could also be your freight forwarders, uh, your brokers, etc. So all of these benefits are applicable from, for the payers and vendors for all of these users across our system. Just some key facts to put it in perspective. You know, uh, the company has, has really grown substantially since it started in, in 2009. Right now, we've got about 60,000, 67,000 active users in the ecosystem, and we're adding around 1,200 new payer users each month and 150 new vendor users each month. And we are on track to process uh, USD 10 billion this year, which is just on 250% growth over 2020. And 2020 versus 2019, we had 100% growth. So that should also give you a, a bit of an idea of the impact that COVID had on our business and the relevance of such a digital payment platform within the industry. It was so needed, you know, once COVID struck, as people started working from home and having to uh, stay away from, you know, contact type interactions with their clients. And we could facilitate all of that, which was a huge part of our success, obviously. And then this year, we're on track to process over 4 million transactions. And we are currently, we've, we've got 20 plus system partner integrations that we've either completed or have in the pipeline to be completed by the end of this year. As most people I'm sure have recently seen in the news, we've just completed a, a Series B, our second round of investment, and it's an investment of $125 million that was made by Insight Partners. This is critical for our business, obviously, because in order for us to be able to provide all these services, keep costs low, implement all these new technologies and continuously innovate, we really need the funding to be able to do so. So we really, so as a company, we're sitting in a really privileged position right now that we have the strong financial position and what it's going to do for us, it's going to really help us with our international expansion. The company started out in the North American market. We have already been working in Europe for uh, about two years right now, but we still have a lot of work and a lot of expansion that can be done there. And obviously other areas like Asia and the Middle East are geographical locations that we're looking at for our expansion. And these funds will help facilitate that. The other aspect that's important for us is also to strengthen our team. I think anybody who's worked in a startup or a company that's in a hyper growth phase will tell you one of the key challenges you have is your success. As you're growing so rapidly, you really need to ensure that you have the right team in place to be able to continuously provide that great customer service, all the development that's needed, as well as being out there in the marketplace to interact with your clients and be able to really understand the challenges that they're having and be able to bring that back and help grow the product. So with all of that said, Hank, what I wanted to do now is just share some of my thoughts on some of the key challenges and issues I think we need to be focusing on within the industry in the future. And, and these are obviously all applicable to uh, the payment side also. So one of the biggest things that I've seen within the industry, and it's a big challenge for us that I think we need to be working to address, is trust. In order for us to be really successful as an industry and learning from the success that Paycogger has had as a company, and then also take into consideration my background for many years working with IATA, 
is you really need to have open collaboration, connectivity, and the willingness to share data across the value chain. It is so critical for us to be successful. If we do not do that, even companies like Paycargo will not be able to add all the value that is possible for our clients across the value chain. Because as islands, we can only do so much. And this is why one of the areas where I'm passionate about and where that I really support strongly is the adoption of a community approach where we have these cargo community systems that are being set up around the globe. So we've got these in a number of areas, both on the air as well as the maritime side. But I really think we need to see more adoption of these uh, community approaches. And not only the adoption of the community approaches, but seeing the communities connecting with each other. This is one of the positive things that I've also seen transpiring in the last year or so, is where we have, for example, Atlanta Airport uh, working with Schiphol Airport, and you have these two airports that have got community systems that have been implemented, starting to connect, learning from each other, and not reinventing the wheel. And I think that at the end of the day, um, if we are truly uh, to drive this sort of open, collaborative, connected, data sharing approach within the industry, these cargo communities are going to be key. And then the connection between them over time is really going to help us to expedite and scale and achieve those benefits. The other aspect that I think is important is obviously having standards within the industry. Without standards, it's very, very difficult to achieve all of this connectivity. And this is where I think what you and your team, Hank, uh, are achieving with one record and why that is so important and why PayCogger is such a strong believer in and, and a supporter of the, the work that you guys are doing. Uh, I think at the end of the day, it's not only about having the standards in place, but also making sure that the standards that we're working on are tied in to using the latest technologies that are out there and continuously looking to innovate and driving the transformation within the industry that's so much needed. And then last of all on this slide that I think is critical is data quality. It's great having all of this collaboration, connectivity and data sharing, but if the quality of the data is questionable, then the whole system falls flat. So one of the things that we're working on our side from a payment perspective to do is really to automate as many of the processes to eliminate human errors. But once again, PayCargo is just one component, component within the ecosystem, and we need the rest of the partners out there really to start focusing on this and working with us to drive data quality and this open collaborative approach. Other aspects that are really important for us and that I think that the industry needs to do more uh, of is being really flexible and adaptable with solutions. You know, technology is cons constantly changing and our clients' needs are constantly changing. And then over and above that, you know, as a, as a, as a industry that, that's pretty archaic in the way that we do things in many cases, when you look at the next generation of people coming into the industry, um, you know, they, they used to having instant access to data and systems, instant gratification, you know, using latest technologies. They're not going to put up with the way that we do things today. So I think it's really important for us to be flexible and really adaptable and to onboard all of these new opportunities. From a payments perspective, there are a number of points that we're looking at, and obviously instant payments is really important, especially during COVID. It became even more important as our partners, especially on the airline side, for example, but many others too, really needed to improve their cash flows as COVID impacted our business. Obviously, you also need to be able to meet with your clients' needs. So if vendors and payers want to have, fle have flexible terms that are varied, you need to be able to do that also. So not a rigid system that basically just has one process, 
you need very, very flexible approaches to facilitating payments. Cross-border transactions is becoming more and more important. And it's not only the facilitation of the transactions, but also how do you lower the cost of doing business there? Wire transfers, et cetera, are a very archaic way of doing business and very costly. So this is an area where we're working in and within the next week or two, we'll be making an announcement of a project that we've been working on in this area that's hopefully going to help transform the industry again. And then obviously the other side of it is also with all of the work that we're doing, once again, you need to be able to integrate with all of the new as well as the legacy systems out there. And you need to be able to do it in a way that's really cost efficient and is not a barrier to entry for the companies who you want to do business with. Some other points that I think are important, I think everybody has seen some of the challenges we've had around data security. This is critical for us. You know, at PayCargo, one of the things that we're very focused on is this area. Um, we do a lot in the background to make sure that our, in, the integrity of our system and security is, is truly world-class. For example, you know, doing, doing multiple penetration testing, SOC audits, as well as one of the benefits of going through a, a review with an investment partner like Insight Partners, when they did their due diligence, they really did a detailed analysis of our business and then helped us to strengthen any areas where there was potential room for improvement. And that's a continuous process and a great benefit of having a partner like, in, a partner like Insight Partners because they've got a business team that helps provide support and access to latest trends, et cetera, that help us to ensure that we are ahead of the game here. One other area that's important is cost of doing business. As you've seen in my previous slides, our philosophy is really to keep the barrier of high cost out of the equation. We really want to ensure that whatever we're doing is either free, so all of the integrations, all of the customizations that we do, both for payers and vendors, we do not charge for that. And even when we are charging with that fee per transaction as our business model, what we do do is we always ensure that that fee per transaction is lower than the current cost of doing business. And that is important because we cannot force anybody to do business with us. So we need to ensure that there is a clear business case and value add both for payers and vendors to join our ecosystem. And then the last thing in terms of these points that I'd like to highlight is user engagement. One of the biggest issues that I've seen is that on many occasions when we're working with large corporates and even mid-sized companies, you get high level buy-in and people understanding, you know, this is the value add. It can really help transform our company by working with pay cargo. We need to get this done. It's going to help save costs, help, you know, with all these digitalization projects that we're doing. But they forget to work with the end users to ensure that they are buying in and adopting and using the systems. So that user engagement is critical. And once again, from PayCargo's side, the way that we approach this is that we're always ensuring that we are also engaging continuously with users on the ground, not only with C-suite. We want to ensure that we truly understand the challenges and pain points that users are experiencing and then taking that knowledge back into our technology and product teams and ensuring that we are addressing them and, and bringing that to the forefront and adding that value for them. As a closing thought, before we get to some question and answers uh, with, with Inc and the team uh, down the line, what I wanted to do is just bring this to everybody's uh, attention. You know, for me, I think we really need to do a better job of promoting the importance of our industry. And one of the ways that we do that, as I mentioned at the start of this session, is how do we view ourselves as an industry? Are we just moving goods every day? Are we just providing a ground handling service? Are we just facilitating payments? 
in my view, it's not. The way we should be viewing our industry is this critical facilitator of economic growth, as well as you know driving you know transformation with the industry and ensuring that there is a bright future for people down the line. So I really think that we've got a bright light shining on our industry right now um, that's helping us to drive transformation and digitization. But that's not going to last forever. Um, I, I might be uh, slightly negative on this aspect, but I do believe that once the passionate passenger side of the business comes back and, and we're really seeing that recovering, we're also going to see this light that's been shining on our industry fading. So my message to everybody out there is I would strongly encourage anybody that, that hasn't done these digitization projects or haven't looked at these opportunities to really think about it and get going as soon as possible because that attention and support that we are getting from CEOs, boards, governments and end consumers right now might not be there within the next year or two and, and, and seems to be fading already from certain discussions that I've had here within the North American market. With that, Hank, thank you very much. I look forward to having an, a, a discussion with you on some of the other aspects of the industry. And I hope that was helpful for everybody out there. Well, I certainly thought it was well, uh, very helpful, Lionel. And uh, I like your closing thought. Actually, you answered a question I had on my list of questions. So I think we can, we can, uh, we can skip that one. Uh, appreciate the, the presentation. We're going to come back to this after we've heard from, uh, from Christian Rieger. And then we'll have a panel discussion and, and there's a couple of questions also uh, from the audience. So we'll take that there. So thank you very much, Lionel. Excellent. Thank you. So um, Christian, would you like to join us? Sure. Hi. Hi, Christian. Uh, I'm going to get straight into your presentation because we sort of uh, we lost a bit of time in the various transitions. So if yeah. that's OK with you, I'm going to make you a presenter now. Sure. And uh, let's see. Um, See if you're a qualified uh, director of software. There you go. You are. Well done. Well, I actually tested with this with Claire prior to the to the webcast, so that was very very helpful. Um, okay. Just let me and close. Before you yeah. say anything, I absolutely love your uh, your graphics there. So um, <laughs> I will be using those myself going forward. So I'm going to leave the stage yeah. and I'll leave. It. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. I think we have a we have a wallpaper pack, and we will release that uh, publicly to uh, for everybody to to enjoy. Okay, right. let's see. Hold on, this is better, I think. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning to everybody west of Europe, and good evening to everybody east of Europe. Um, my name is Christian Rieger. I'm Managing Director and Senior Vice President Software Development at Riga Software. I usually just say my last name and the company's name is not a coincidence. I'm also co-owner among with my uh, family. We are five siblings in the company, which was founded by our father in 1985. Um, our father is very well known in the industry and he's been retired now for two years and he's very happy with his retirement. Um, we do software systems for logistics companies, mainly freight forwarders, handling agents, and customs agents. Um, we do the operating software. So we produce the paper or the electronic, or ideally the electronic documents that are then sent around the world to enable uh, cargo to move from place A to place B. And thank you very much to Hank for again inviting me and letting me speak. I think this is the fifth year in a row or something like that. It's, uh, it's an honor really to do this. And um, despite my extreme stage fright, I'm always very happy to do it. And let me tell you, it doesn't help speaking to an empty room. Um, and I very much look forward of meeting everybody, hopefully by next year, 2022 in Geneva again. Um, I will have a short presentation, which represents an outsider's look into the challenges of digitizing the air cargo industry. Um, what I hear from a lot of people as well, if you look at the passenger side, that was very easy. It was quick to adopt the e-ticket. That was a success and it was just, whoop, and you and Air Cargo, you've been talking about this for 20, even 25 years. And from the outside, nothing much happens. And why is that? And I think one thing that became clear during the last year, um, Lionel also mentioned this, 
that the pandemic was a game changer for the air cargo industry. And the air cargo industry, what they did very, very well was coming up with innovative and creative solutions. The conversion of passenger planes into, Hank doesn't like the word, me neither, but everybody calls it like that, so let's leave it like that, freighters. We had one project with uh, D.B. Schenker, a customer of ours, in conjunction with Iceland Air. They uh, Schenker chartered uh, three Iceland Air passenger jets, converted them to freighters, and then did charter flights from Munich to Reykjavik and onwards to Shanghai. Um, there were a lot of parties involved. We had to, uh, Swiss port had to get involved on the ground handling side. We had to talk to German customs. We had to talk to Iceland customs, set up all of the new messaging structure around that. And that was a very, very fruitful project. Everything got implemented very quickly. It was, I mean, German customs, they were sometimes not as bureaucratic as they used to be. Um, everybody was very flexible and it was a great success for, for everybody involved. And um, so going forward, what we've seen is cargo or air cargo becoming from the ugly duckling of the industry to the shining star from Cinderella to Rockefeller. And the thing is, will this stay like this? And Lionel also mentioned this. I'm of the same opinion. It's not really, it will go back down. I mean, now the spotlight is there and now is the chance to take it. So we, or the cargo industry makes money from keeping things going and we can, keep things going while other things like passengers are not flying anymore even through the pandemic and we keep important things going which need to move quickly from place a to b in march it was face masks because europe was out of face masks and it was personal protective equipment for all the nurses the, uh, the doctors and everything and you can't put that on a on a on a ship and wait for three or four weeks but that needs to move fast so all of these things happened but what did not really happen is that resources were put into where money is where, where they are needed most which is digitalization so let's look at the passenger side of what ha happened with the e-ticket and everybody's talking about it and saying well it's a success and and i mean it's true right now um when i bought a plane i haven't done it this year but i was on a plane last year believe it or not um my boarding pass is on my on my phone and i can use that to to go through the whole process. I use that at check-in, I use that at security, I use that at the gate and, and going on and I don't need any more paper. But if you look at it, at the, at the uh, digitalization, it's not only that processes were being converted from analog to digital, but also a lot of processes were delegated. So previously, I got a ticket, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to still know that, where, the, where you went to your travel agent and you get a little booklet this thick with your ticket, which was actually 14 pieces of paper. Today, I get an email and then I print my ticket, or ideally, now I use my phone to do this. I go to the airport, I don't go, or I, most of the times I don't even need to go or should, but I'm actually actively discouraged to go to a check-in counter and talk to an agent, but they, I have to go to a self-check-in. I can, if the flight changes the gate, well, I can just read that and do that. I carry my documents throughout the journey, so if they're required, I can immediately uh, show them or I can be requested to show them. And I can react on the events, which is like my bag is missing or I didn't catch my flight and I can do that proactively because I have a voice. So from paper to electronic, what we, what we see is the processes went digital, the business was streamlined, which is excellent, but a lot of it was just handed over work to the customer. And I like to call that digitalization, difficult word. Um, so what do we need or what do we derive from this? I derive from this that cargo lacks a common language. Cargo cannot speak, it cannot listen, it cannot read, it cannot react and it cannot complain. It can't take care of accompanying documents. I mean, you can attach them to it, but if they become loose or something, they're, they're gone. And if you look at the, the, the passenger the touch points, as a passenger, I take a train to the airport or taxi, I check myself in, I go through security, I board, I manage to de-board, I manage to do the immigration process on the other side, I manage to pick up my bags from the, from the baggage counter, I manage to push my car through customs, and then I take a taxi to my final destination. Cargo cannot do any of these things on their own. Cargo needs assistance. So 
we've seen, okay, cargo cannot delegate. Um, so we can't do it like in the passenger way, but we have to do it a little bit smarter and a little bit, well, not better, but more digital. And what cargo, uh, what passengers had really did good, or what, what was an excellent job of them, is to roll out all those processes worldwide. Every airport accepts this ticket. Every airline accepts the boarding pass. It's the same code. It's the same information behind that plugging into central um, systems that keep the data. So what does it require from us to do, to give cargo its own voice? We need the willingness, we need the involvement, and we need the collaboration of all parties involved in the car, in the supply chain from door to door, from, from um, departure to destination. And we've seen that this actually works during a pandemic, at least at the beginning phase. And my real hope is that we don't need another pandemic to actually get things going again. And then people say, well, but there is truly digital cargo. I mean, I go to, I get a DHL package or FedEx or, or something, and I, I can track it from origin to destination. And I always know where it is. I always know the status. But yeah, that's easy. I mean, this is a door-to-door -door process which is uh, truly digital because they have a simplified standardized product. It's very limited. If it doesn't fit in the envelope, it doesn't ship. If it's more than a certain amount of kilos, it does, they can't ship it. So these are easy products where the supply chain or the whole thing is controlled by one company or by one integrator who, who can tell everybody, okay, do it like this, do it like this, do it like that. And with Air Cargo, what we are looking at, it's it's a little bit different. We have uh, multiple stakeholders and, and participants. We have um, multiple IT systems. Each IT system is suited to the, its own particular niche of the supply chain. So we have uh, systems of the shipper. We have a system of the freight forwarder. The ground handlers are using something. Customs agents, airlines have their own systems. And they all need to talk to each other. They all need one language. And I think paramount is that there's no central budget or investment decision, which is Good. I mean, it needs to be spread out like this. But what we've seen in the pandemic is that when we stand together, we can move mountains and that the sky is not the limit. So we need one system with one language, multiple IT systems acting as one to share the data. Cargo needs its own voice, its own language that is universally understood to be able to speak. We as the industry need to act as one, one for more openness, one for more collaboration, one for more investments. And this is something that I hold very dearly to my heart as I've seen it so many times happening. If you don't invest in the tooling today, by tomorrow, you will have incurred the same cost as the, uh, without the tooling, but you're still lacking the tool. And this is so true in so many places. So I think there needs to be investment now into automating things into doing the tooling, the benefits will come later and they will come. And that was a lot of words now. There was a lot of talk. So I would like to put some action to my words. Um, what we as a company will do, we will introduce a Cargo XML to one record conversion toolkit. It will be open source. It will be developed openly on GitHub, just like the one record standard. And We've done this with, and we will collaborate, and we are already doing this and continue to do this in the future with the Yata Digital Cargo Working Group focus activities, the one record data model, the one record API and security, as well as the one record pilot and coming up the one record implementation and transition focus activity. And that's our investment in the future of the industry to let cargo speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. That actually is a really nice surprise. Uh, that's a nice gift um, you're giving to the industry. Uh, and it's sorely needed. In fact, um, I think a lot of the things you've spoken about are, are really uh, pointing at the challenges we have, but also very much the solutions. And, and this idea of an open source tool, uh, I would welcome that. And anyone that's listening to this, if you have ideas for open source tools, um, Christian is showing you how to do it. So that's fantastic. Can I ask the other speakers to uh, come back on on the screen, and I will uh, I will then uh, take the uh, clear the presentation screen so that 
Okay, very good. I think this is working. Uh, everybody's unmuted. Um, so uh, firstly, thank you everybody for, for your participation in this. Uh, three different perspectives on, on very similar and related issues. And, and to some extent, there's already some, some agreement on, for example, the transitional opportunity or challenge that we have at the moment. Um, I'd like to, I'm going to skip a few questions because I don't think I have enough time for everything that I want to ask you. But um, w one question, actually, I want to come back to, uh, to Dorothea. And I asked you to talk about um, sustainability. Um, one of the things that, that you probably don't know yet is this is going to be one of the biggest topics at IATA going forward. And it will come to us in the digitalization environment as well. Now, as a topic, sustainability has been there since I was a kid, okay? There's nothing new in, in the fact that we need to have a sustainable planet. But for some reason, and you mentioned it yourself, all of a sudden, people are talking about that, uh, Dorothy. Do you have an explanation for that? Why is that? Why all of a sudden, during a pandemic, customers are telling you they need to have a more sustainable um, uh, transport from you? Well, I think it's a lot to do in Europe with these Fridays for Future demonstrations where it was really the young generation telling us, the old ones, yeah, to to make sure that we uh, leave a planet for them and, and it's not because that we don't live uh, on their cost, if you want. And I think um, that was actually stopped during the pandemic, but the thoughts were already there. And uh, for example, here in Germany, we see that it really goes into legislation. And in your home country, the Netherlands, I mean, you also see some lawsuits where a company need to make sure that they they don't ruin the planet for the next generation. And the, in Germany, it was about the freedom rights of the next generation that need to be uh, need to be considered. And I think that is happening in several countries. And on top, I think now we've got uh, uh, the Biden administration that has made a point of uh, uh, making sure that the uh, Paris targets are achieved. China has made their um, plans uh, towards CO2, CO2 neutral China. So, so it really has triggered a big movement, I think, in all the large industries. And now um, it, it's also coming to the companies that feel they need to do something about it. And, and for example, many companies have now committed to these science-based targets where they need not only to make a target that's easier to say in 2050, okay, long time out, I'll have something done, but it's targets that come with very concrete measures and where you need to show what is it that you're doing to get there. And there suddenly it's a completely different discussion process, I think. Hmm. Um, myself, working for IATA, I look at the problems like that from an industry perspective, right? What is the what's the sustainability of the entire industry? Uh, I think as an airline, uh, obviously, you need to look at sustainability of your product. That's that's evident. And at the same time, you're part of a much bigger supply chain. And I know that that you're involved with a couple of partners in CO2 tracking across. Uh, from one airline via a forwarder, I think Agility, and then to another airline, Cathay. Um, and I was asking myself the question, is, is sort of the CO2 performance uh, a case of who's the weakest link? Or is it the fact that they all need to do their job for this to really work? And if it's the latter, I actually think digitalization can help. What is your view on that, that your role as part of either, either a company or as part of a supply chain? So it everything adds up. So you need the commitments and, and the work of every partner in the industry. But I mean, regarding the CO2 emission per kilo per kilometer, if you want, of course, the air part of it is uh, uh, contributing, I think, the most yeah, on the negative side, if you want. So that's mm -hmm. why, I mean, if, if you do the bit of trucking in between, um, that has a much lower impact. So, for example, us as an airline, 99% of our CO2 footprint is flying. And we do have an extensive road feeder service uh, network, you know. So, um, that's why I think the airlines are very important in that. And that's why also I think the for both forwarders and shippers also look very much at the airlines in this. Okay. Then if I sort of uh, take you from there, and, and, and so you mentioned uh, trucking, and I agree that if you look at the, sort of the, the distances involved compared to what airlines do, the mm -hmm. probably the, 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 the weight is upon the airline. At the same time, and I'm going to ask Christian this question, and I could ask the same question, Lionel, and I might, but you are you're involved with other modes, including maritime. 
um, maritime is without question and a similarly bad CO2 actor. Um, I also think that you as a software and solution provider play a role in facilitating access to that sort of information if the company has it. Mm. Um, have you heard requests like that say from the maritime sector or um, what do you think is the role of digitalization in sustainability? Well, excellent question. Thank you, Hank. Um, we have some of our customers from the freight forwarding business actually approach us and say, well, can you offer us or can you show us something like what is the CO2 impact of my shipment? If I do it from Munich to Shanghai via air freight, via sea freight, or even via rail. I mean, this is possible these days. Um, and it all depends on can we actually get to the data? I mean, Dorothea has shown that Lufthansa has opened up an API where I can actually do, okay, I can inquire, give me Munich to Shanghai via, I don't know, um, with this flight, this equipment, what's the CO2 equivalent? Then I usually have a pretty good picture of what it takes to have the door to airport and the airport to destination, to final destination, uh, tracking things, which is limited to, to the impact of the, of the flying or the ship, uh, obviously. But it all depends on that data being available from, from other parties. And yeah, it, it, I mean, with, with the airplane, it's pretty, pretty obvious. But with, with a container ship, like if you have 20,000 toys, if you have on, on one shipment in one container, if you have a full container, okay, maybe that's doable. But if you go to less container, it gets quite tricky, I think. Interesting. So if I put words in your mouth, <laughs> The more details you have about, for example, the shipment, the more you might be able to actually calculate uh, the, the, the breakdown of that sort of information. Yeah. And yeah talking exactly. about uh, other modes of transport, uh, Lionel, uh, a question I've been struggling with or playing with, we be, be not struggling so much as playing with, is, um, is, is cooperation between transport modes a good thing or should we compete like we've done in the past. Now, you mentioned several times, I think, in, in, in your presentation, cooperation, working as a community. Do you have a view on that? Is, is for example, any work that you do, say, on maritime, has a positive impact on the work that you might be doing in aviation, vice versa? And I'm talking Absolutely. about digitalism, right? Uh, in, in that part of it, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think just if you see what's happening right now with all the congestion that's taking place within, within our broader transportation ecosystem, what's the negative impact that's been had on the maritime side, some of the relief is obviously coming from the air side. And I do believe that, that at the end of the day, even though we see these as different transportation modes, that interconnectivity and digitalization that connects us is coming. Um, and, and we're seeing this, you know, I mentioned the air cargo community systems. So in Miami, I know when the airport was looking at doing an air cargo community system, they were thinking about doing it in collaboration with the Port of Miami, for example, tying in both the air as well as the maritime side of the business. So I really, I really think you're gonna see more and more of this cooperation taking place um, I think you're also going to see changes. I think you're seeing new entrants on the air side and you're seeing new entrants on the maritime side as people are adjusting. So you might see somebody who's, a, who's traditionally known as a shipper who is starting to look at air, et cetera, to broaden their value add to their customers. When they do that, clearly there's going to have to be a need to take systems and make them seamlessly within their business to, to cross all of those modes, right? And then obviously one of the positive things I've seen is even with, with, the, with the hackathon that's coming up, when you look at the hackathon that's traditionally been very air focused, but now we see maritime partners starting to show interest in that. So I think the writing's on the wall, you're definitely going to see that happening. And then if you don't mind, I, I just wanted to touch on the point of sustainability because uh, I think one of the deeper aspects that's happened here is with COVID and the pandemic that took place, people, a lot of people, have questioned you know, what they value in life, right? How they do business, things are changing. And, and, and I think there's gonna be some permanent changes there. And I, I think from our industry perspective, once again, people do not realize the impact we have on sustainability. You know, we talk about systems and doing all of the digitization. With that comes unseen down the line impacts, as I mentioned, you know, by improving the movement of vehicles at an airport 
and reducing obviously then emissions. Um, what we're doing to bring in digitalization, taking out all these paper processes, that's, that's also, there's a lot of sustainability behind those initiatives, but nobody really talks about it. So, so, so we need to do a better job of that. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I'm looking at the clock. Uh, there was a question actually a little bit related to what you just said around uh, how we could uh, cooperate and make sure standards will go across the modes. Um, I think you indicated that that would be a good idea and so I don't want to actually go much deeper. Uh, we have a few minutes left. I'm going to ask one question to all of you, uh, the same question and I'm interested in your answer. Um, uh, when when um, Lionel he started his presentation, he threw out a few words that were very strong statements, I think, um, and the reason I repeat them is because I think I agree with them, is that you mentioned that the industry is crossroads, that uh, we have to adapt the way that we operate. You mentioned words like speed, transparency, exponential growth, advanced technologies, and the last one, the worst one, disruptions. Um, I'll start with uh, with Dorothea. Does that sound like how it is today? Are we at that crossroads? What is your view on that? Or is it just a temporary uh, blip? Well, I think our industry has realized uh, that IT is adding value and IT in the means of data, in the means of automated uh, processes, in the way of connecting different partners in the industry. So I think, uh, that's, I think, one of the positive sides of COVID-19, yeah, that last year we've seen that we cannot meet each other personally, but the goods can still travel if only we've got good enough processes to make it work. And uh, so, for example, we've seen that digital bookings have really soared. I mean, that was amazing how much that took up uh, because people just felt from their home offices or remote offices it was so much easier to do it this way. Sometimes people went home, they didn't have their company phones with them, you couldn't call them anymore, uh, etc. Yeah. So, so I, I think it's helped us to see that this is also a way the industry can work and there's a lot of efficiency to be gained there. So I think okay. that will stay. Okay, good. Thank you. I hope so. Because these are actually positive um, uh, influences. Mm. Uh, Christian, you already said yourself, you, you, I think you concurred with the Lionel um, without having coordinated your answers before, but then I would sort of go one step further and is how bad is it, you know? Um, how, how big is the opportunity and how big is the threat in the moment? It's an, it's an interesting question. I agree with uh, Lionel on that we need to standardize on something and that we need to, everything needs to be automated to ensure that the data quality is there. I mean, this is a point I've been pushing since 2017, 2018. It's nice to see that it's, re that it's being reinforced now. Um, as far as, as disruption, it's, I mean, disruption, a lot of people use it and um, I'm, I'm not, disruption always looks like a toy at first. It's, people disregard it. People say, oh, it will not work. It's, it's just a baby. It can't walk. It can't speak. It can't, it can't do anything, it's not useful. And so it, it usually it builds up and builds up. And then at a certain point, it's, it's just like going bankrupt. I mean, first slowly and then suddenly. Um, mm. I don't see anything like that in the industry right now, or at least I can't clearly see something like this. And on the airline side, um, I mean, it's hard because on, on the airline side, you have billions and billions of investments of money that you need to, to go into the industry. It's, it's difficult to imagine a new player coming in and then disrupting that business model or what we see in, in maritime shipping. I mean, we are now down to what, three major alliances. And then I don't think there's a good way to put something, to put something in between and, and saying, okay, we will capture the global market. Then the next day, somebody is, uh, uh, these goals and these guys are going to disappear. Um, okay. A lot of people are talking about this in freight forwarding, where we see new companies coming into the market, being truly digital. I think everybody knows what we are talking about, or the, the digital forwarders. But at the end of the day, they need to move goods from A to B. And yes, they do give their customers. Usually, they put the customer first. They put the customer experience first, and so and so on, with their internal IT systems. And I think it's a very interesting um, aspect. Whether that is disruption, I don't want to judge that. 
Okay. I, I don't think I so. I like the uh, I like the measured answer. You could have said absolutely or absolutely not. But I prefer your answer. Um, it's far more realistic. Uh, then then if I go to the next level, because Lionel, you already answered your own question in a way anyway. Uh, so I would ask it differently. Is that uh, you mentioned the next generation? I, I absolutely concur to you. I can't see my kids wanting to accept the way that we work today in the future. Although probably. I would have said the same thing 20 years ago for myself, and I've still accepted it. So, um, so in that sense, we, we never know. But so, what is your outlook then? So, so we have a temporary window of opportunity. We know that the long term things have to change one way or the other. So it's going to work. When? What, what do you think? Is that? Can you put a timeline on this? <laughs> no, I don't think I can put a timeline on it. But what I can tell you is that I'm 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 very optimistic about the future of the industry. I, I think I think there is a lot of change taking place right now and certainly with COVID that has helped fast forward a lot of the progress that we were we were slowly making as an industry. But Christian from, from my perspective from, from a payment side I do think there they are disruptors and hopefully pay cargo is one of those looking at bringing in some of these new technologies and how do we change the industry and you're absolutely right. You know, people initially look look at you and they say, "Is this really something to watch or not? Is it going to happen?" But before you wipe out your eyes, it's the new norm, right? Uh, it's exactly what happened on the passenger side. So I think I think that the change is yet to stay. But at the same time, I do think the ease at making the change is is going to change. It's going to become more difficult as the passenger side of the business comes back. Right now, we've got that opportunity where people are paying attention to us. That That's not always going to be there. And I think that's the challenge. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, all of you, for your participation. Uh, I thought it was very interesting. Um, this is only the first of many webinars coming. So um, uh, have a look uh, at the at the IATA website web page. Um, I don't want to finish this without thinking our sponsors. In fact, two of them are on the screen here, Riga and Pay Cargo, but also Nextshore and IBS. And uh, you actually make these you make these events possible, and they're really important. We had a good attendance today. I know that for a fact, at least at least as many people are going to be watching these webinars afterwards, the recording. So, thank you very much for everybody, for the participants, for the um, for the speakers. And, uh, and the team at IATA that also made this possible. Thank you very much. And with that, I'm closing this webinar. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Hank, for the opportunity. Bye-bye.